No matter whether you're going to use a VR headset or your standard PC monitor, MUVR has got you covered. I'm about to show you everything that it takes step by step to get MUVR up and running on your own PC so you can start playing your favorite retro games in VR in no time at all. Fire up your PC and if you've got one, grab your VR headset because you're about to learn something new. All of the magic here happens through the power of the MUVR software. I have the website linked for you in the video description. MUVR really is a special piece of kit because it can play 70 plus game systems from four different decades of gaming. You can scroll through the list on the MUVR website to see the list of consoles supported by the program. Here's the actual downloads page for the MUVR software. This is also linked for you in the video description. Come down to downloads and click on it. This will take you directly to the download section on the page. There are two different things you need to download here. The first is the MUVR software in zip format. Click to download the zip file. The other is this very specific version of RetroArch, version 1.7.5. Don't try to download RetroArch from the main website, it will not work with MUVR. Only download the version of RetroArch shown here. To start the setup process for MUVR, navigate to File Explorer in Windows, then select Downloads from the list of choices. Both of the files you just downloaded are in zip format and need to be extracted. Right-click on the files, select Extract All, and Extract in the bottom right corner. Once each of the zip files has been extracted, right-click on the zip files and select Delete to send them to the recycle bin. You'll need to copy the contents of the RetroArch folder into a RetroArch folder inside the MUVR folder. Double-click into the RetroArch folder, and then select everything that you see inside the RetroArch folder. Once you have everything highlighted, Right-click on any one piece of the content inside this folder. From here, come down to Show More Options, and then select Cut. If you haven't used the Cut feature in a while, don't worry, everything stays in place until you go to the next step. Go back one level in the navigation structure to the root of the Downloads folder. From here, double-click into the MUVR folder. You'll find a subfolder inside here called RetroArch. Double-click into that folder you'll find that this folder is actually empty. From here, just right-click and select Paste. It will move all of the files over from the RetroArch downloaded folder and put them properly in place inside MUVR. Excellent. Go back two levels in the navigation structure back to the root of Downloads. You don't need this empty folder anymore. Right-click on it and select the link to send the folder to the recycle bin. Successfully setting things up here is all about putting the right types of files in the right places. So to that end, I'm going to take the Downloads folder that has the MUVR folder in it and snap it over to the right side of the screen and lock it in place. I have a folder called Demo pre-staged on the computer and it contains some assets that are necessary for things to work correctly inside MUVR. I'll take that File Explorer window and snap it into place on the left side of the screen to lock it down. The first subfolder inside this demo folder is called Labels. I'm going to double click into this folder so you can see what's inside and what we have to deal with to make cartridge labels work correctly inside MUVR. There are two standards cartridge label image files need to meet to work correctly. First, they need to be in .png format. So if you try to use a .jpg file for this purpose, it will not work correctly. There's an easy way to fix this in Windows. Just right click on the JPEG file and select Open. Inside the Photo Viewer window, you'll see a triple dot set near the top center of the screen. If you click on this, you'll see an option for Save As. Click on Save As, and this will allow you to go to a drop-down underneath the file name and change the file from JPEG over to PNG. This is the fastest and easiest way I know to take any downloaded cartridge artwork and just convert it over to PNG for use if it isn't already in .png format. With the task complete, you can close out the photo viewer by clicking on the red X in the top right corner. You'll have a JPEG and .png image of the same cartridge label now. Go ahead and right click on the .jpg image file and send it to the recycle bin. The second standard that has to be met for cartridge labels to work correctly inside MUVR is that the file name of the label needs to match the file name of the associated ROM file. So I'm gonna go back one level to the demo folder and then go into the ROMs folder. I have ROMs pre-staged here for Atari Lynx and for the NES. So I'll go into the NES folder here and look for the file that represents Super Mario Bros. 3. The best way to make sure that you copy the name of the file properly is simply to click on it with the left mouse button to select the edit mode. Then right click on the file name and select copy. 
Now go back in the navigation structure to locate the folder for labels. Double click on the labels folder and locate the image file that represents the label for your game, in this case, Super Mario Bros. 3. Do the same thing. Left click on the name of the file and then paste over it by selecting it with the right click on the mouse, then select paste to overwrite the file name. Then you can just click outside of the file and it will lock in the change to save the file name. I'm gonna go back one level in the navigation structure here to go back to the demo folder so we can take a look at the second part of the artwork process, posters. I have a folder pre-staged here called posters and I'll double click into this folder so you can take a look at the contents. There's a poster here from my favorite old time movie, The Empire Strikes Back but it has an incorrect file name and it needs to be corrected. Here's the deal. This video game poster's website, also linked for you in the video description, has some really cool information on it about how posters work inside MUVR. If you take a look at these screens, it shows you that posters are actually named by number rather than a text name. This graphic not only shows you the locations where posters will hang inside the virtual reality room that we're going to step into in just a moment, it also gives you their aspect ratios. As you scroll down through the website, you'll see that each of the four walls inside the bedroom is shown here, along with their associated poster locations and aspect ratios. You can also see some additional poster locations on the dresser located inside the room. Just like with cartridge labels, posters need to be in .png format. Now that you understand how posters are named, you can go to the poster of your choice, click on the file name, and replace it with the number where you want to hang the poster. In this case, I'm just going to use 01 to hang the poster in the first position inside the room, which is right above the bed. Excellent. Now that we've got the file name sorted out for posters, I'll go back one level in the navigation structure back to the demo folder. The other two folders here contain ROMs and subfolders, and also there's a folder here with the system BIOS files that RetroArch requires for some key systems, including Atari Lynx, which we'll take a look at in just a moment. Let's get all of this stuff copied over into the MUVR folder. Double click into the folder in the File Explorer window. The first subfolder you'll see here is called Custom. Find that folder and then double click into it. Inside this subfolder, you'll find three more subfolders, one for labels, one for miscellaneous, and one for posters. I want to take a quick moment just to show you what's inside the miscellaneous folder. I'm going to double click into it because inside of here you'll see this examples folder and when you double click into that what you'll find is you can customize much more than just cartridge labels and posters. You can actually change out these graphics and customize the entire environment inside the virtual bedroom. Now that you know what's there, I'll go back two levels in the navigation structure. One to go back to miscellaneous and once again to go back to the custom folder. First up, let's go ahead and copy over the label files. Double click on the labels folder and you'll see that there are these example folders here. Go ahead and delete these. You'll find out how we can actually replace these in a much better way in just a moment. So go ahead and highlight everything that you see inside that folder and delete it. Navigate to the folder where you have your cartridge label art saved. I'll drag over everything inside this folder and then just drop it right into the labels folder inside the custom folder. Go back one level in the navigation structure to get back to the custom folder. Then go to the location where you have your poster art saved. In this case, it's that demo folder inside a subfolder called posters. I'll double click into that folder here. Inside the custom folder, locate the folder for posters and double click into the folder. Now you can grab your poster artwork, no matter how many files you have, and drag and drop them directly into this folder. A quick note here. There's an examples folder here, just like there was in the card labels folder. Double click into this folder and you'll see that there are templates available for all three sizes or all three types of aspect ratios for posters available to you, along with a list of numbered proper file names to use as examples. Pretty cool, huh? Now that all of your artwork is copied over, you can go back three levels in the navigation structure until you get back to the root of the MUVR folder. Next up, let's get your game ROMs copied over into the proper location in the MUVR folder. In this case, I have the game ROMs saved in a subfolder inside the ROMs folder in the demo folder. Inside the subfolder, I've got two subfolders, one that has a ROM for the Atari Lynx and then one that has two ROMs for the NES. Grab your ROMs and drag and drop them into the games folder inside the MUVR folder. It's best to keep your ROMs in subfolders and you'll find out why in just a moment. Okay, now that the games are copied over, there's one more thing that we need to move over to MUVR, and that is the system BIOS files if you plan to use emulators that need them, like the Atari Lynx. 
So from here, I'm going to navigate over to the system folder, which has the system BIOS files in it. Remember how there's a RetroArch folder inside the MUVR folder? You'll need to locate the RetroArch folder and double click into it. You're going to find a subfolder inside RetroArch that's also named system. Once you locate the system folder, select everything that's inside your system BIOS file folder and you can drag and drop it all over to the system folder inside RetroArch in one straight shot. Once you have your system BIOS files in place, you've got everything copied over that you're going to need moving forward. But there's some additional setup to do before you run MUVR, so don't jump the gun here. Go ahead and close out the File Explorer window that contains the content that you've copied over to MUVR. From here forward, you can just go ahead and expand the File Explorer window for MUVR. Go back in the navigation to the root of the MUVR folder. You'll find a subfolder here that's called Game Scanner. Locate that folder and double click into it. You'll find the executable file for Game Scanner here. Double click on it to launch the program for the first time. When you first open the software, you should see a confirmation message on screen that says the RetroArch patch for MUVR has been applied successfully. Come down to the bottom right corner and click OK to continue. From inside the interface for the game scanner, click on Update Core Data. The process takes only a moment in real time. Once it's done, you'll see a pop-up message appear notifying you that no game content has been updated, only the data for the core sets inside RetroArch. Close out the notification by clicking the OK button in the bottom right corner of the notification window. There's a text button in the top right corner that says Attempt Autofill. Click on this text button to continue. The software will look in the games folder for any types of systems that you might have ROM content for. And then it will also import those systems into the software. Click through the notifications and you'll see that the systems in their cores have been added to Game Scanner. Lock in these settings by going up to Save Changes and clicking on it. Next up, come over to Download Missing Cores and click on it. I only have two systems here, so there's not a lot to update, but if you have a number of different systems represented, you may see a lot of downloads take place. Close out the notification by clicking OK in the bottom right corner. Next up, click Scan Games for MUVR. This may take a while depending upon how many games you have. Click OK in the bottom right corner once the scan is complete. You're done with Game Scanner. You can close out the software by clicking the red X in the top right corner. Inside File Explorer, go back one level in the navigation back to the root of the MUVR folder. It's easy to overlook this last step, but if you do, the labels will not show on your cartridges inside MUVR. Go back to the Custom folder and double click on it. Then locate the Labels subfolder and double click into it. You'll find that the Game Scanner has created the proper subfolders for the cartridge labels for your systems. So all you have to do at this point is grab the labels that match each of those systems and just drag and drop them into place. See, this is why we deleted those sample folders out because Game Scanner was going to automatically create matching folders for each of the types of game systems and ROMs that you have. Go back two levels in the navigation structure back to the root of the MUVR folder. All right, you've put in the work. Now it's time to go on the grid. Locate the executable file for MUVR and double click on it. You'll see a bright white screen appear, a logo splash screen for Unity appear, and you may very well be launched into total darkness. Here's how to fix this. If you take a look in the center of the screen, you'll see a small white dot. This is an aiming dot and it works a lot like it would inside a standard first person shooter game. Since moving around inside VR can give some people motion sickness, myself included, I'll move slowly throughout the environment. To look around in the environment, click the right mouse button and hold it. You'll see that the cursor inside MUVR snaps directly to the aiming dot. Let's get the lights turned on in the room so that we can see what's going on. I'm going to hold the right mouse button so that we can get to the aiming dot in the center, and I'll move slowly up towards the ceiling. When you get up to the ceiling, you'll see that there's a ceiling fan with a light fixture here. When you hover this dot over items, you can highlight them so that you can take actions with them. In this case, I've highlighted the ceiling fan. If you press the space bar, it turns things on or off, just like it's done here. See how there's a light right in the center of the ceiling fan? I've highlighted it with a dot, and when you press spacebar, instant light. Let's take a look around the bedroom and see some of the key things that we set up along the way. First of all, if you take a look by the bed, you'll see a window that shows both daytime and nighttime, in this case, nighttime. Also, if you take a look here, you'll see the Empire Strikes Back poster 
mount it on the wall in the number one position. So now we can confirm that the poster artwork is labeled correctly, is in the right format, and working in the software. Along with using the mouse to look around, you can also navigate the environment forward, backward, left, and right using the WSAT keys. You can also use the Q and E keys to move up in the environment and down. I've closed the VR environment and I'm going to reopen it here because I want to point out something to you. Every time that you relaunch MUVR, you'll find that the variables for the environment have been changed. For example, it's daylight here so you can already see into the room even though the light's not turned on. Inside MUVR, you have to link consoles and displays together in order to play the games. To do this, move the aiming dot over to a game system that you want to use and press the F key on the keyboard. F is in Foxtrot. Then go up to the display you want to use and you'll see that a pink line appears. Press the F key and you'll see that that pink line converts over into a connection cable between the two devices. You can use this method to create connections between any of the displays in the room and any of the game systems that you have at your disposal. One of the user-friendly features of MUVR is that in a lot of cases, consoles spawn directly connected to displays. Here you can see an NES that's already pre-connected to a display below it. To turn displays on and off, Use the mouse to move the aiming dot over to the display and press the C button on the keyboard. Game consoles work just a little bit differently. I'm going to go ahead and highlight the NES on top of the display. See, if you press the C on a game system, it'll actually open up the door like it will in this NES so that you can insert or remove game cartridges. You can see that Super Mario Bros. 3 is already preloaded inside this NES. So all I have to do here is just press the C button to close the door. Once you press the space bar with the console highlighted, it'll turn on. Let's take a closer look at what's going on here. I'm going to use the W key to punch in several times until we can get the display as close to full screen in the environment as possible. You're still moving around freely in the environment at this point, but you can't play the game yet because you haven't shifted the focus of the controls from moving in the environment to playing the game. All you have to do to do this is highlight the display with the game and press the space bar. You'll be able to move around in the environment just a little bit, but all of the control will primarily be shifted over to the display so that you can use the keyboard controls. You can also pair a Bluetooth controller just like you can with regular RetroArch. If you'd like to transfer control from the gameplay back over to movement in the environment, press and hold the control key and then press the space bar. You'll see that the display will light up with a border around it and you'll now be able to freely move around the environment again. Remember how I pressed the C key on the keyboard while highlighting the NES and it opened up the door and exposed the cartridge? This is how you change out games. You do it just like you would in real life. You have to swap out the cartridges in order to play the next game you want to play. Alright, once you press the C key and expose the cartridge, you can pick up and move the cartridge or anything else in the room by pressing the X button on the keyboard. To see how the cartridge turned on its side, it lines it up so you can press the X key to put it in the system. When you move farther away, it rotates the cartridge back onto its face. I was never much of one to keep my room clean as a child, so I'll just press the X button here and drop it on the floor. Don't worry, I don't treat my games like that now, because, you know, adulting. Okay, I'm going to take a moment to center the NES up in the screen, and just kind of back away from things a little bit to make room for the next step. If you press the tab key on the keyboard, it pulls up a virtual on-screen menu. There are two things you can access here, your inventory and the settings options. I want to grab a different game for the NES other than Super Mario Bros. 3. So what I'll do here is I'll take the aiming dot and move it over to the menu option under inventory for NES. Once you have the inventory item selected that you want, press the space bar. As you can see here, the list of games available to play is shown and it also includes the cartridge label art. Pretty cool. Move the aiming dot to the game you want and press the X key on the keyboard to grab the game cartridge. Press the tab key again to close out the virtual on-screen menu. Now you can take the NES cartridge or the game of your choice and go back over to the NES system using the mouse and the WSAT keys. Important note here, however, don't forget to blow in the bottom of the cartridge so that you don't get that flashing red light when you turn on the NES you'll find that once you get close enough to the open door of the NES system, the cartridge will automatically rotate into the position for you to be able to insert it into the system. Once you have it here, 
Press the X button and the cartridge will automatically be inserted into the system. Then press the C key on the keyboard to close the door on the NES. To turn on the NES to play the game, just press the spacebar. All right, I'm gonna back away from the NES, rotate the screen just a little bit and kind of come down so that we can center up the game display in the center of the screen. And sure enough, Tetris is running just like we would expect it to when you insert an NES cartridge. Once again, to play the game, just highlight the display in the center of the screen with the white dot and press the space bar. You'll be locked in and ready to go. And now for the ultimate MUVR gaming experience, play with a VR headset. In this case, I'll be using a MetaQuest 2. Inside the MUVR folder, there's actually an executable that specifically is made to launch directly into the MetaQuest headset. So here, I'll double click on the listing for Force Oculus or Meta.exe. You'll still see what's happening on your computer monitor, but once you put on that headset, the entire experience is transformed. Seeing this on a flat screen just doesn't convey the awesomeness that is being in this virtual environment. It even has a few tricks up its sleeve, like being able to use your virtual hands to manipulate objects inside the virtual environment. Like turning on displays, for example. You also have the option of using virtual pointers on your physical controllers with your VR headset to select items. And as one final test to make sure everything's working right, Atari Lynx BIOS files are being loaded correctly and the ROM is running correctly. And yep, I'm just as good at California games and virtual reality as I am in the real world. Hey, did you know you could be using your same PC to play your favorite Wii and GameCube games? Check out this video shown on screen and linked in the description and pinned comment to learn how to use the Dolphin emulator. I'll see you there.